Hello, I'm State Representative Mike Davila from the 7th House District. Welcome to Ohio in Focus. Hello and welcome to this edition of Ohio in Focus, a program that brings state government to you. I'm Brad Miller, and I'm pleased to be joined today by State Representative Mike DeVilla, who serves the 7th House District, which includes portions of Cuyahoga County. Representative, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Brad. Good to see you today. We're going to touch on a, a number of topics. We're going to start with the state operating budget, which uh, has been the bulk of the focus here uh, at the State House for the, about the first uh, five or six months of the year. Um, why don't we start, uh, the governor is now signed into law. From a broad perspective, what are some of your takeaways from the budget? Well, it's always a lengthy process, as you indicated. So we began this when the governor presented his budget to us at the State of the State uh, down in Wilmington earlier this year, uh, late February that was, and then it came to us about a week after that. And since then, it's been moving through the legislature, through both chambers, and um, that always takes some time to get done, and there are many changes that occur as it goes along. Ultimately, what we have here is uh, an operating budget that funds um, over $71 billion for state operations, um, all the different agencies of, of state government, um, funding for our school districts, a number of other things at the local level. Um, it includes a fairly substantial tax cut once again, over $1.85 billion. It's about a 6.3% income tax cut. Uh, we've done a great deal once again for small business. So we've provided um, in the first year uh, a 75% tax cut uh, against the first $250,000 of gross revenue. And then it goes to 100% in the second year of the biennium. So no tax on the first quarter million dollars of revenue for small business. So I think that'll be a substantial uh, kind of shot in the arm in addition to what we've done in the last two budgets, which cut taxes substantially already by about $3 billion. Um, moving to a more local level, uh, what are some of the things that uh, your constituents in, the, uh, in Cuyahoga County's 7th House District uh, should they be aware of? Well, the big thing that I was really fighting for in this budget, as we've done in the last two budgets, is adequate school funding. We've got four excellent school districts that make up the suburban area that I represent in the 7th District in the southwest portion of the county. And several of our districts over the years have had some real challenges with tangible personal property tax phase out. And so uh, one of the things that I was fighting for as the budget moved through the House and over into the Senate part of the process was to ensure that, that those TPP reimbursements were still kept in place. Uh, we ended up putting about $100 million extra dollars into the budget to cover two of the four districts in my district that had that kind of result, as well as 91 others around the state that were similarly affected. So I think we've landed in a good spot in terms of school funding now that keeps everybody whole. Um, so that was really kind of the local thrust in terms of our district. Um, more broadly, both as a member of House leadership and, and one of only three majority members in the House from Cuyahoga County, uh, over my four and a half years here now, I've taken a real sort of broad approach to taking care of Greater Cleveland generally, as well as our district. And so in that respect, we've put some additional funding in place for some important institutions around Cleveland, like the Natural History Museum, uh, the Cleveland Institute of Art, and a number of others, the Garfield Memorial out at, uh, at Lakeview Cemetery uh, to get that uh, shored back up and, uh, and fixed once again. One of your, uh, maybe your primary focus as a member over a number of years um, and now in uh, the 131st General Assembly has been in increasing transparency and government efficiency. Um, uh, any headway made in this budget or other things going on in, in, uh, in that realm? Well, we've had a major initiative moving forward for uh, the second General Assembly in a row now in the form of House Bill 46, and this is our Open Ohio Bill. Uh, we've gotten it out of the House once again, and it's sitting in the Senate at this point and um, ready for hearings over there. Um, the Senate's been busy with the budget just about the time that we got that bill and some others that I was working on out of the House. They were sort of waylaid on the bigger project that the rest of us were dealing with the last number of months here. Um, but there is progress in this area as well. Treasurer Josh Mandel has been working his way around the state and encouraging local governments to participate in this program to provide their data into this online expenditure database <clears throat> at um, ohiocheckbook.com. And that will really, I think, provide greater transparency for citizens all over Ohio to be able to see how, they, uh, how their money is being spent. Um, we'll move on to a, a piece of legislation that you are uh, working on as a sponsor. Um, before we get into the bill, it, it deals with music therapy. Before we talk about the bill more specifically, um, can you first explain to us what music, music therapy is? 
Well, it's taken on, um, I think, some notice here in recent years as a, as a result of Gabby Giffords, the former congressman from Arizona, um, who, was, who was tragically shot uh, while at a, a town hall outside a shopping center in her district. And music therapy was actually used in order to help uh, restore her ability to speak. Um, she was shot in the, the left side of the brain, and, and of course, music is a creative element that uses the right side of the brain and through different pathways that can be recreated through music and other types of art therapy, um, they were able to, to reconnect those, those passages and allow her to, to get, get her speaking ability back. So that's the most famous instance of it recently. Um, this was brought to my attention by a constituent who works at Baldwin Wallace University, my alma mater, uh, in my hometown of Berea, which I'm happy to represent. And she's had a music therapy practice at BW now for a number of years, working with um, autistic children and, and other folks who have found real progress by using this type of therapy to improve uh, their ability to get along in life. And the issue that, that she and others brought to my attention was the fact that uh, this is an area that really requires licensure in, uh, in a similar way to other healthcare services that are offered across the spectrum, and it's, that's not the case today. And so these folks approached us and said, can you put in a bill that creates a licensure process for music therapists here in the state of Ohio, as a number of other states have done, to make sure that the people who are actually practicing in this area are well qualified to do so and are able to be covered by insurance. Um, you touched on uh, Gabby Giffords. Um, feel free to talk more about the bill as well, but what kinds of people or what co other conditions might this uh, uh, be impactful? Well, it's any number of different things. And, and again, I, I return to autism because I was able to sit in uh, with the lady at, at BW and witnessed one of the, the sessions that she offered there. She'd been working with a young man who's 15 today. She started working with him when he was two, um, when he was not able to speak, had very limited motor skills, and today has really moved along to a much more functional young man. And that's just one instance of, uh, uh, of a type of condition that's been able to be improved by using music therapy. Um, you have also uh, was a sponsor of a bill that would move Ohio's presidential primary um, as it currently stands, the primary in Ohio is the first Tuesday after the first Monday of March. This bill would move that basically a week later. Um, what was the inspiration behind that bill and what will it do? Well, we've moved our primary as a state a number of times over the years. Uh, folks who are my age and older will probably remember um, the May primary, which is the traditional time that our, our primaries fall in non-presidential years even today in the state. Uh, a number of years ago, the primary was moved to the first Tuesday after the first Monday in March, as you indicated. I think really at that point in time, in order to provide Ohio um, a little bit more uh, kind of notice in the process of presidential primary sequencing, many states have tried to move forward to the point where both major national parties have tried to protect the primacy of the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary, which are traditionally the first in the nation locations for those respective contests. And as a result, they've changed party rules in such a way to make sure that People don't line jump in these other states ahead of those first two. So in the case of this year, the Republican National Committee had put in place rules that would penalize states for moving too far forward. So any state that would go before the end of February would lose all of their delegates to the National Convention. Any state between March 1st and 14th would have a proportional process, which would effectively turn into 16 congressional district primaries around Ohio. And then anyone March 15th or later would have all of their delegates and be able to present the strongest possible delegation. So particularly with the fact that the convention will be in Cleveland next year, which is a great economic development tool for, for my hometown, uh, we wanted to make sure that Ohio is putting forward the strongest possible delegation for that convention. And on the Democratic side, there's no negative impact to it based on what their national party rules happen to be. So this bill has moved through uh, the legislature. Um, what has the response been like? And maybe in a more practical sense, what, how do you see this affecting Ohio voters? Well, I think it's a good thing. I mean, for, for, for one thing, um, the boards of elections have come to us at the beginning. Anytime they can get additional time between elections to, uh, to plan their work and to carry out the administration of an election is a good thing for them. And so this gets them one extra week between the municipal general election in November of this year and the presidential primary um, next March 15th. So that's good just from the standpoint of being able to prepare voters, get the information out, and allow them some extra time. And then from the standpoint of Ohioans generally, um, regardless of which party they happen to be uh, participating in the primary for, there's an extra week to get ready. Um, but it still puts Ohio, I think, right in the heat of the discussion in terms of choosing, choosing the nominees for the two major parties. 
Um, we have a few minutes left. Um, it's been a very busy first six months uh, here in the Ohio House and the legislature uh, in general. Um, we still do have another year and a half of the 131st General Assembly still to go. Um, this program is based on uh, you providing some uh, information and uh, education for the viewers and your constituents back home. So now that we are entering uh, the summer months, um, are there any general updates either in the 7th District or here at the State House that you think uh, your constituents uh, should know about? Well, sure. I mean, the, the great thing is in the summer months is being able to get out of the State House and back into the district more frequently. And of course, I'm, I'm generally down here even when we're in session Tuesday through Wednesday or Thursday and then back in the district the rest of the time. But the summer months open up greater opportunities to be able to get around the district and do some other events and festivals and those types of things, visit with constituents. Um, each fall and each spring, we do a set of office hours around the district. So we'll be scheduling those here very soon for, uh, for the fall months. But uh, during the summer, I just encourage constituents to reach out as they're always welcome to do. And if there's a small business to visit or a civic organization to stop through and see, there's greater opportunity during this time of year to be able to do those types of things. Uh, and at the end of the, the program, um, we have our guests explain to the viewers how they can reach you here in Columbus. Sure. Well, constituents can reach us anytime using email at rep07 at ohiohouse.gov or by calling 614-466-4895. And that information is at the bottom of the screen. Representative, I know it's a busy time, but thanks for sitting down with us. Thanks very much. And we look forward to seeing you again on the next edition of Ohio in Focus, a program that brings state government to you. Thanks for watching. <music>